right, give yourselves a hand. We made it. Woo hoo! All right, y'all look so beautiful. I mean, seriously, absolutely gorgeous. Anyway, I mean, I the name of this session was I thought it was going to be called. You ready for this? Psychogenetic death. Now that that's not going to be a good name for a session, so I'm not going to name that <laughs> because it just sounds like really mor you know, kind of morbid and stuff. So what I did is I I because I want to start from the beginning. What's going on, right? Because I'm a really avid against religion, and I'm all for God's word, and there's a reason for it, and I'm going to cover it. Because we all are preconditioned by our background, our religion, our philosophy, our culture, has trained us to be absolute idiots, and we've got to change this. I'm not joking about this. This is suicidal mania, and I've got to help you break out of it because you don't realize how in danger your life is. And until we break out of it, we are set to have a very short and miserable life. And there's a way around it. But it has to be done God's way, not man's way. Is that making sense? Right. So, Father, thank you for the greatness of your word and this great privilege to teach your word and to help your people truly be free, to be able to walk in this day and time as more than conquerors, and to truly see themselves as you have declared them to be, so that they can rise up and overcome every single obstacle in their life and truly live a life more than abundant, walking in your shadow and in the, in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead are risen and return, Lord Jesus, your anointed. So we're going to start off with something really strange. I know, me, no. <laughs> I'm going to start off with something a little bit different, right? It's called the true way of life because these are secrets that the Word of God reveals concerning life. See, people may, I was just studying uh, the latest discoveries over at Pompeii and Herculeum. And I was really fascinated by it. But one thing everybody had is that everybody there was very, very religious. And they all died in front of their idols. They all died in front of their, their, um, their temples. Some most of them died in their temples, all praying to their God. And, um, and then lava just came and wiped them out. Now, when Mount Pernatubo blew up in the Philippines, I've been teaching the word there for almost three years. And they, when, when the Mount Pernatubo was erupting and the uh, pyroplastic started coming down the mountain, they went to God, exactly as I taught them. And that pyroplastic went, heading down toward the village, went around their house. And everybody had ran to their house and they stayed in their home, like almost 80 people or so. But it went around them wiped out everything else, destroyed everything else, and they were perfectly safe. The key is, what does it take to be able to be in the right situation at the right time, every time, without getting yourself totally messed up by doing what you think or what you feel? So that's the subject of this. Why is it that we are always set for destruction? Number one is because we're Greek and Romans. Our culture, our customs, the fact that we even go out and get a tree and bring it in and worship a Saturn, put Saturn star up there and call it Christmas. It has nothing to do with Jesus whatsoever. But you see, we're still trying to hold to the Greek and Roman religions. We're still trying to worship them. So I need to backtrack all the way back to what is called the suche in the Bible. Now, suche is your heart, your soul, and your mind. And whenever they're in agreement, Whenever your heart, remember when Jesus says, Say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in your what? Heart, your reality, your perception of reality. Don't doubt it. That shall go. All right, what is this all about? The, the suche, your heart, your soul, and your mind, is absolutely required to be in line for you to be benefit. But most of the time they get in line is when we're scared to death. And we, in our mind, always project ahead, so we always project our death our destruction. Got it? And we can't do that. Now, if you, I mean, if you can, everybody, you know, most everybody does. The reason people died is because most of them die because they, they go off a cliff, like I did, and they picture themselves as the grease spot at the bottom of the valley, except I didn't do that. I went off the cliff, not on purpose, but I went off the cliff and I just let go and went to God and, and did pro suche, and God directed and protected me. Car got totally destroyed, but I was okay. Except when they pulled me out of the broken glass, cut my arm. But besides that, not a mark on me. So understanding this stuff is not a joke. 
If it was, then why would I be teaching it? I'm teaching it because it's real and it works. But you've got to do it whose way? God's. And this is why it's in the biblical research. What does the word really say? So without further doing, all right, let's go into the name of this. I'm not going to call it, you know, psychogenetic death. I'm calling it right in a bucket or bad translations. <laughs> that much more. It's less, less morbid, I guess, right? All right, so let's find out. Now, do you all know what this is? It's a rat in a bucket, right? Well, it's a Norwegian rat. Norwegian rat. Norwegian, Norwegian rat, right? This is the one that was done in experiments. Okay. So, but that's not a person. That's right. But the same principles that work in a rat, we find out over the last hundred years, also work for human beings. There's a standard construction of the human brain all mammals have the same basic construction are all subject to the same problems. Does God know this? Yeah, he designed it. So let's figure out what exactly we have to be aware of. Where is the word of God teaching us to give us so that we can truly be what the word, what God intended us to be? All right, so let's start off with the first experiment done in 1957. Kurt Richter, Dr. Kurt Richter, is a Harvard graduate and scientist with the John Hopkins University. This is a well-renowned, I maybe never heard of them, but they are well-renowned, well-renowned. Well and did a series of rather unorthodox experiments using water, buckets, and rats that resulted in an amazing discovery. He wanted to see how long rats could swim before they drowned. Now, you can look this up. You can look it up on the internet and all kinds of places. Go to any college, university. This is well-known. If you're taking college and school and basic um, psychology courses, you're going to hit this, right? Richter put rats into a large bucket, half filled with circulating water. Being notoriously good swimmers, the rats lasted for how long? 15 minutes. How long? I want you to really say it. Go. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Before giving up, Succumbing to the bottom of the, of the bucket, just dying. They gave up. In a follow-up experiment, as the rats started to give up and sink, he pulled them as they were still struggling. They're still trying to make it, and they're, they're using the last bit of strength. He pulled the drowning rats to safety and dried them off, giving them a brief period of rest, and then only to put them right back into the same bucket. Now watch carefully here. Now, what do you think happened? Oh, I remember. No, 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 don't mix up two experiments. There's two separate experiments here. This is the primary experience, experiment, then there was a second set of experiments done on, with another premise, but I'm just doing with this one specifically, okay? Those same rats now swam for an average of 60 hours. You understand? 60 hours. Well, how long is that? How long is 60 hours? How long is 60 hours? How long is 60 hours? Wow! The ones that had not experienced that salvation, they had not experienced it, lasted how long? 15 minutes. Those who had experienced that salvation, 60 hours, or what? Two and a half days. A rat that was temporarily saved survived 240 times longer than the one that was not given any intervention. The reason God gives us his word is so that we may not know it, we may what? Do it so we can see that he is real, that he's a living God, that he's real. And then when you do that, you wind up seeing that it's real and you go, oh my God, this is real. And now, no matter what happens to you, you're going to last in any situation 240 times longer. No matter what the situation is, no matter how much the stress is, and when we go into... Uh, uh, Dr. Frankel, 
who was in the concentration camps during Nazi Germany and, and search for meaning of life, he talks about the people who died, who survived, and who it, like it never happened to them. Do you understand? Now, why am I teaching this? Because we're heading into some really bad times. And I've been teaching the word and helping, trying to help people understand. They go, that's not, and I was like, what is wrong with everybody? Ah, I figured it out. And that's what this is about. That should crack that, that wall. Okay, so you understand. If you know there is salvation, then you will last 240 times longer than if you didn't. But it hasn't something that you have to say. It's not a mental thing. It has to be something you know with your heart, your soul, and your mind. Got it? If you don't have it, you won't make it. Now, in the Bible, we're going to be covering an account of what God did to bring up David. Why was David so extraordinary? All right, because David was the, one of the greatest men of God in the Bible. Why was he? What was it that God did to him? How many got a hint already what it would be? Nobody has a hint? Just spent the last 10 minutes giving you hints. All right. <laughs> what do you think God did? Right, he's getting him to see that God is what? Real. All right. God said, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Him who? Goliath. That's a, that guy is almost what? Could be anywhere between 11 and a half to 14 feet tall, depending on how you're measuring him. He's a big dude, right? Thy servant, he's talking about himself, will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war, a murderer from his youth. Being that he was so big and he had this genetic modification where he could grow extremely fast really quick, by the time he was six, he was killing people. He was a warrior of tremendous strength and ability, and at six, he was murdering people. So that's like... Uh, an unusual situation is David's going to fight with him. How many people has David fought with? Zero. Did not use a sword? Nope. Now, understand the situations is that you and I are always caught in situations we have no idea how to handle. We have no idea how we're going to win. We have no idea how we're going to overcome it. And that's where God comes in. But if you never experience it, it will never be real. And when it's not real, you're not, you're going to wind up being that 10, 15 minute type people. The first obstruction comes, the greatest battle, and you die. Got it? David says to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came out a lion. Okay, what's a lion? You're a lion? We're not a, we're not a pussycat. Oh, I call my, my kitty cat lion, see? When I started... No, we're talking something much more impressive. That's a lion about ready to eat you, right? That's what he looks like. That's just as he's about to tear apart an antelope, Lily, tear it apart. You're seeing it from a long distance lens just before he kills the animal. So if you see a lion looking like that at you, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> if God's not part of your reality, you're his lunch. <laughs> Got it? <laughs> and a bear. What's a bear? There's a little cubby. Oh, look at the little cute little cubby bear. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a 12 foot monster. Wow. Do you see why he was ready for Goliath? First, the lion. Okay, come here, kitty. And then the bear, you know, Mr. Teddy. And then. <laughs> That boy, right? Got it. But if you had to face him, what would you do? Run like hell! No, bad idea. That's not how it works. You face it. David didn't look at these as bad days. Oh, the lion. How many of you were opening the front door and there's a lion going, rawr, rawr, and you go, oh, this is a bad day? No, <laughs> that's not how David looked at it. All right, a chance to prove God. If you open the door and there's a, you know, 11 foot you know, bear, 
And what would you do? Ah, what a bad day. No, David goes, this is another chance to prove who? God. And then Goliath, another chance to prove what? Because once you've done it, then it's easy to do it again. Got it? If you've never done it, you're faking it. You're pretending. And you are as good as dead when the situations come up. Do I make myself clear? So the lion and the bear took a lamb out of, the, out of the flock, and I went out after him and smote him and delivered him out of his mouth, and when he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard, referring to the lion, and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this perverted, uncircumcised... I added that word perverted. There wasn't enough. This uncircumcised Philistine... By the way, the Philistines are bad guys, right? That's from our culture. Greek and Romans. You understand? They're Cretans. They're from Greece. They colonized the, the, uh, the Philistine area. The croissant. They colonized it. So we're talking about how bad the Philistines are. You're actually looking at a mirror. You're pointing to your own culture. We're the bad guys. We're the baddies? Yep, we're the baddies. Ah. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And of course, Saul gave his standard religious response. You know, go and the force be with you. You know, that kind of crap. All right, does everybody see the situation? Saul didn't face him. Saul was scared to death. Saul was a trained warrior. David was just a shepherd. But he had taken out the lion and the what? And the bear. What was before the lion? A wolf? Maybe. And what was before the wolf? You see what I'm saying? You have to take the challenges in order to what? To grow. then you'll never experience it otherwise, and it won't be part of your reality. If it's not part of your heart and your soul and your mind, then when the time comes, you're faking it, and it's going to not benefit you whatsoever. Does that make sense? All right, Frank, where's the door? I'm leaving. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm not feeling too good. I'm, then you need to go to church somewhere else. So once you've done it and you see that God is real, which has never ceased to amaze me every single time, but it's like, duh, there's, it's like this absolute assurance. It's like, and no one can see God. And it's like, he's here. And they're like, I don't, know, I, don't know. I don't know what they're looking for. This is where the problem comes in. When you're fa you understand 240 times more than what you're capable of. What you think you're capable of, 240 times more. Understand. Whatever your standard is, whatever you think you can do, you can do what? Period. Everybody's operating way under par because their heart and soul and mind is not aligned. The experiment was so intense, they said, well, it had to be because of lab rats, you know, where, so go out and get some, some wild rats. So wild rats, they threw them in the water, they died in 15 minutes. They said, well, let's take, capture some more wild rats, but this time, just as they're still trying, they're still trying and they're losing strength, we'll save them, and then we'll put them back in. And again, 240 times. Almost two and a half days, they could swim. See the difference? We are all living way, way, what? Under par. That's why it's impossible for those who are once enlightened, once you like, ah, oh, I got it, God is, and have tasted. I mean, you've actually experienced that heavenly, the word their gift is dawn, which is like that growth level. It's like when you graduate from high school, they give you a diploma. Then you graduate from, well, maybe you don't. But anyway, 
going to college and they give you a diploma, right? That diploma is a dome. It's a certification of your ability. When you reach the point where God's able to come in and do things for you because you now see it as real, it's part of your heart, your soul, your mind, now you've reached that dawn. Got it? That certificate, that sheepskin graduation, if you will. That's what pistis is. It's a, it's a growth and development at each level until you reach the dawn. Got it? It's translated a gift. But that's, it should be like a certificate or, or graduation paper. And I've tasted the good word of God. The good word of God. What's good? God's Bringing God's will to pass. And the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them. to You can't. It's impossible. How could you redo it? You either got it or you what? You don't. You can't fake it. Well, you need to recharge. That you never had it to begin with. This is why people mainly, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have faith. Bullshit. doesn't work like that. You grow into it. You want religion and just, you want to be like the Greeks and Romans and just believe in Neptune. Neptune will save me. Believe in Aphrodite. She will save me. Believe in Jupiter. He will save me. No, they won't. The only I can do is look at Pompeii and see that it doesn't work. Or Herculeum. They're monuments to a God that is totally of no value. By the way, the day that Mount Vesuvius erupted, they're worshiping Vulcan. And when it was rumbling, they'd go, oh, he's accepting our sacrifice in our celebration. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Okay. You understand how silly religion is? It has nothing to do with the Word of God at all. Zero. But I like having Christmas trees. Then get a Christmas tree, but don't call it Christmas. You know, whatever. Don't merge them. Two separate religions. You don't like pine trees. That's not true. I go and buy them all the time and plant them. <laughs> but not inside the house. All right. So it's impossible. You never had it to begin with, is what this is saying. All right, so what do we have? What do those mice, rats, and human beings all have in common? Psychogenetic death. They were convinced they were going to what? Die. Now, there's many accounts of people who had a carcinogenic, um, well, cancer, okay, moving through their body. And one guy said, you have terminal cancer. And the guy d continued to just really change his heart and everything, and he was healing. But he still thought he only had so many months to live. So even though the cancer was removed from his body, because his heart and soul and mind said he was going to die at that time, he died, and there was no reason for it. He died with cancer, but he didn't die what? of cancer, and they still don't know what killed him. It's not anything except his own heart, soul, and what? Mind. We do it to ourselves. It's self-inflicted. The mice, same reason. They gave up, and they allowed themselves to die. The rats, same way. Human beings in the concentration camps of both the, the Soviets and Nazi Germany and the Japanese all gave up. Do you understand? There's a book by Viktor Frankl. I would highly recommend reading about it, the different types of people, people that were just <laughs> saying it and saying it and saying, well, things are going to get better. Things are going to get better. You know, and that mental, you know, just, 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 just picture it, you know, that kind of crap. And I can do with God. But positive believing will get you. No, it won't. It won't either. You understand? Man's search for meaning. He records over 300 people's lives in the, in the Nazi concentration camp. Records who died, who survived, who were permanently crippled, and who had, had as if it had never affected them. 
the object here is that when the stuff hits the fan coming up, that it has no effect on you. It requires a certain state. Got it? Now, how many have ever heard of the word seer school? You ever heard of school, seer school? Did you go through seer school? OK. I went through a one-day course. Uh, <laughs> hardly counts. But I got my, my badge, which I can't seem to find anywhere. But I was a seer. Now, what is seer? Seer is a special school by the Navy and the Marine Corps that teach you what it is to have someone try and kill you, someone try and capture you, someone torturing you, and trying to put you to death and how to survive all of those. It stands for um, survive and, okay, wait a minute, evade and resist and escape. So you're taught how to survive. So, by the way, Warner Springs here is where the Sears School is at for desert environments. Because it is, it's a desert. How do you evade the enemy? How to fight the enemy when you have no tools? How to be able to survive in a prisoner of war camp? And they are really intimidating. Um, everyone I know went through it. They told me some of the stuff. They're not supposed to, but they did anyway. Um, they, have a, they hold a, a gun up to someone's head, and they pull the trigger and blow his brains out right in front of you. Except it's not really him. It's designed. He's got a, uh, an explosive bag, like in the movies. And it makes you think he, he just shot him. And they point the gun at you. You're next. I mean, they really make you feel you're captured. They torture you, put you on the waterboards, so that when the time happens to you and you've already been through it, it has what? No effect on you. Got it? That's Sear School. Was I tort? No. <laughs> One day survival course, that's all Sears. I didn't go through the whole thing. But nonetheless, you understand? It takes people are going as you don't want. The reason I had to go through is because I was on an air crew and I might be captured. So that might put me in this school for a day. The other guys had already been through the whole course. So I didn't have, so if I went down with them, I'd still be able to survive. And they would teach me what I needed. I didn't need to graduate from it. So that's a 10 day course, pretty long. It's kind of fun because they sneak up on you and they capture you and put a bag over your head, drag you away. Then they, they beat you. And now the reason is because, oh, I mean, they, they really treat, they treat you like hell, like you've been captured. Then they torture you and they put you in, you know, sweat boxes. They make you cramp your whole body up. They make you an absolute torture. Everything the enemy is going to do to you. So you say, well, I survived that. I can survive anything. Because <laughs> you've already been through it. And everyone who's been through their school and been captured has always escaped and had no effect to them. Isn't that cool? But those who had never been captured before, when they're captured, they break. They lose it. Got it? All right. In the next stage, there was another component of this. And this is rather upsetting. They had a question. They, they, they proposed, well, what happens if we let, rather than saving the rat as he's still exerting the last bit of his strength and we save him, what happens if we let him actually drown and head to the bottom and then recover them? So when they give up and they hit the bottom, then we pull them out and resuscitate them. So that was an interesting question. That was an interesting an experiment. Because you know what they did? This is like really weird because they had them in the cage and they had the vat over there with the water in it, right? So the bell would ring, right? The bell would ring and they'd open the cage and the rat would, they'd grab him and they'd bring him over to the vat and they would throw him in the water. And he'd swim around, swim around, swim around, swim around, you know, for 15, 20 minutes and then start heading for the bottom. They didn't do anything. They waited until he hit the bottom and was pretty much dead. Then he reached down there, grabbed him, pulled him out, resuscitated him, brought him back, put him back in the cage. They waited a day, made sure he was fed and he was fine. Then the bell rang again. They opened the cage. They reached around, they went and grabbed him. They finally, he was running around, they grabbed him, brought him over, threw him in the water. 
and he swam around for six minutes and then headed for the bottom. And when he hit the bottom and they could see that he's no longer breathing, he reached in there, grabbed him, brought him back, resuscitated him, and got him breathing and put him back in the cage. The next day, the bell rings. They reach in there, and he is laying on the floor of the cage. They pick him up. He's like a, a wet rag. They throw him in the water. He jumps up a little bit, and then he relaxes and heads to the bottom. He hits the bottom. He's out of breath. He's losing it. He's dying. They reach in, grab, pull him out, resuscitate him, put him back in the cage. Next day, the bell rings. He immediately just falls. <laughs> Lays there. What, what, what was the scientist doing? Conditioning him to what? To give up. To give up. And that's exactly what they do. And every time, in every concentration camp, any prisoner of war camp, they want you to give up. And you do not, what? Give up. If you're talking about the adversary, he's like the original designer of this stuff. You don't let him, you don't give up to him. Got it? Frank, you're scaring me. <laughs> Welcome to reality, all right? This stuff's real. This is no joke. Our whole society is keeping us from reality. But reality is about to hit whether we like it or not. So what does the word say about this? Galatians 6, 9. Let us not be weary in uh, well-doing. Doing what? The word well means good. Doing God's will. Carrying it out. For in due season... When God knows his best, we shall reap. Here's the biggie. If we, what? Faint. Faint not. You do not give up. Give up. God's not going to come through because he's going to be teaching you to be a what? A failure. He's not coming through if you give up. Do I make myself clear on this? Oh, that was intense, wasn't it? Now, you can verify everything I've taught you here. I'm not kidding. But it explains why God does what he does and why it is the absolute best. And this is why I'm teaching you the words so that you can walk with who? God. And you can know that he is real. All right. Next stage we're going into. There he is. Norwegian rat. That's not a mouse. That's rat, right? Okay, now, next thing is called associative bias, right? Now, how many have heard the story about how um, that guy did an experiment with a glass of uh, orange juice, right? And he put a uh, skull and crossbones on a bottle and put orange juice in it and said, here, drink. Here, don't mind what's on the outside. Just drink it. Guy couldn't drink it. Why? Because he associated the skull and crossbones with what? Poison. Even though the, the, it was a clean, a clean jar, a clean you know, container, it just had the skull and crossbones on it. And the word's poison. And he just wouldn't drink it. Just orange juice. But you see those words, poison, in the skull and crossbones, and you're like, no, I'm not drinking this. What's that called? Associative bias. Now, not is that a bad thing? No. Anything that's marked with that skull, you ain't going to drink, even if it is orange juice. Because we've been what? Conditioned, and rightfully so. You ever, walk a, you ever seen a red light? Everybody stops. Powerful light. It paralyzes everybody. No. We all agreed by associative bias to walk across the street on green lights and not on red, right? So... Does anyone know what this is? Does anyone know what this is? No, jewelry. Yeah, that's right. It's jewelry. <laughs> right? Now, what am I teaching you? This now I'm teaching you now is what? 
associate bias. Okay? This is jewelry, right? Now, what does that got to do with associate bias? I'm about to show you. Okay? Is this all bearing with the Word of God? Absolutely. I'm teaching you not to destroy yourselves. Got it? The owner of the store is having trouble selling a few pieces of turquoise jewelry. She, now, this really happened, by the way. It's in a book called, um, uh, by Caldini. It's, it's one of his books. I'm just taking a quote out from it. Got it? Influence. Uh, influence, thank you. She believes he had priced the quality prices reasonably. It's also, also high tourist season with regular foot traffic so there's no reason why these pieces should not sell. But even after placing them in a more prominent position in the store, they just stubbornly sit there day after day, customer after customer, nobody bought them. And she priced them as low as she possibly could. Finally, right before the owner is about to leave, for an out-of-town buying trip, she scribbles on a note to her lead saleswoman to price everything in the display case at times one half. In other words, cut the price, what? In half. Just to get rid of that turquoise pieces, right? Well, guess what happened? When she returns from her trip, the owner is not surprised to see that the jewelry had been sold. But she was surprised when she learns that the saleswoman had misread her scribbled note. The saleswoman read the times one half as times two. She doubled the price. All the pieces of jewelry had sold at double their original price. What? What's that all about? What's this about? We, people, how many people know about turquoise? Absolutely what? Oh, you do. Okay, you're, you're weird. All right. Most people, <laughs> right, I'm, I was, I studied gemology. Now, this is, you know, I studied gemology for like, what, eight years? And I became, I was like on the verge of being a gemologist, but um, I didn't. I'm pff, dummy me. But anyway, what happened was I had these really gems I picked up in Thailand, beautiful sapphires. And I had some rubies, small rubies, and I wanted to take it to an American grader, American grader, and I already graded them. I knew what they were worth, but there's only three gems. I'm like, Pfft. so I decided, you know what? I'll really make them look excellent by adding a bunch of junk, you know, just semi-precious to it, and that way they would see it, and they'd see how much more beautiful it was. Smart, huh? No, stupid. Because you know what? Seeing that those others were junk. He associated my quality gems as what? Junk also. See the problem? It backfired on me. We assume by paying for something, if you don't know what something is, you walk into a gem store and you don't know anything about gemology, and you see, well, that, that there is worth $1,000. That one's worth $500. And they're both Zircon. That must be more valuable because it's got a higher what? Price. How many know how much how much does a Rolex watch cost? Pardon? Sixty five thousand dollars. Uh, you can get them up to a million dollar Rolex watches. How good do they keep time? They don't. They're worthless. You gotta adjust the time almost every day. They're really terrible timepieces. They're not made to be timepieces. They're male, you know, vanity things. Men wear just a like Rolex, you know. I stand up there and sh show you my Rolex watch, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But you understand the problem, the vanity, the vanity things, right? So what happens is, now, now women don't laugh. Just, that's, not, that's not funny. Because women go in there and they buy Gucci, 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 Goo purses, right? And they pay like six, seven hundred dollars for a little purse that's like, you look at it like that thing can't even be worth a hundred bucks. But it's got the name Gucci, Gucci, Goo on there, right? 
So don't laugh at the men. I mean, you can, but you know. The pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> All right. All right. You understand the problem. So let's look at something that's ridiculously absurd, right? I don't know if you ever heard of Cristiano Ronaldo, right? No. The world's greatest. These pair of shoes are over a thousand dollars. It don't cost that much to make these. <laughs> Costs around seventy-five bucks max. Now some of these Nike shoes, now he gets a sponsorship. All his shoes are free. They pay him. To walk around wearing these things, right? I don't know. You ever heard of LeBron James? What's that symbol mean? Nike, right? And then people walk and they buy everything he does, including the stupid armband, right? Nike, see, Nike. I wonder why, huh? You know, this kind of stuff, right? Do those LeBron, you know, standards show off your Nike. And then Roger Federer, if you're into tennis, right? And he used to be at, he used to be Nike. Now he moved over into uh, Uniqlo, right? Which is a Japanese manufacturer. Ridiculously priced for the same. That the quality is not that good, but and nonetheless, you're not buying the quality. You're buying the name. Same with mic. Same with computers, like Apple computer. And you look inside of it. You're going, why is this thing worth five times more? It has nothing to do with the price. It's all in the name. With that little logo up there. The logo alone is worth 700 bucks. Take the logo off, and pff, just like any other computer, put the logo on, and all of a sudden it's an extra $500. That's what you're paying for, that little logo. That's what you're paying for, the little logo. What is this? This is a social bias. Every time he plays golf, they pay him ten, twenty thousand dollars. So as long as he wears the hat. Now people want that hat because then they'll be golfers like him, <laughs> or they'll be tennis players like him, and they'll do the same pauses and show off the same shirt. Because it's got to be that's how it works, isn't it? You don't have to train. You don't have to do anything. Just wear the clothes. <laughs> What's it called? Social bias. Social bias. You're associating two things that really have nothing to do with each other. All right, another associate bias problem, racial pro pro profiling, right? Have you ever had someone like, I got bit by a dog. If you see me wear glasses, so I got one ear is lower than the other. Looks really weird because the glasses are tilted. The reason being is that a dog bit my ear off. I had to have it reattached. So my ears lower than the other one. Dumb, stupid things, right? The hair was hanging down here, and then. <laughs> but anyway, they reattached it, which is kind of cool. It still works. Okay? <laughs> Just a little lower than the other one. <laughs> but understand, right? So, so now I have a fear of dogs. Well, I don't have a fear of dogs, but growling dogs. Oh man, I hate growling dogs. Because that's what he did before he bit me. And I went by and this dog went, Row, rah, and he went, oh, oh. <laughs> I'll kill you. <laughs> I am seeking revenge. So <laughs> I had a I had a um, uh, another dog attack me. What was it? A pit bull attacked me, right? They kind of clomp down, they don't let go. But there's ways to make him let go. I assure you, there's a way. Anyway, I don't like getting bitten. I don't like being attacked. And I will kill the dog that does that. And I'm ready. I had one bit pull, pit pull, pit, bit bull, pit bull, went up there and I shoved my fist down his mouth. I was hitting, I was hitting for his nose and I missed. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I wound up down his throat and I just kept it there. He's screaming and he can't breathe. And I was trying to decide, what do I do now? But I realized, as long as I kept it there, he couldn't do a damn thing. And I decided, he ran away. 
I don't like growling dogs. Yeah, I can go, I like that dog. Like, yeah, good dog. Right. But the dog goes, I'm like, oh, dude, I'm going to hurt your feelings. All right, so, <laughs> but do you understand the problem? Because that one time that I had my ear ripped off, that one time, I hate all dogs. Now, I've learned to tolerate dogs, and I, and I like dogs now. But I don't put up with any growling. I will not allow growling at all. You understand? Anyway, but you understand, that's why you prosuche. That's why you, this translated prayer, but it has nothing to do with prayer. Because prayer is, oh, please, God, you know, make that woman love me. Oh, please, God, you know, give me a raise. That kind of crap. That's, that's Roman Greek route. When you go in prosuche, you're delivering your heart, your soul, and your mind to God for what? Doctrine, reproof, and correction. Where am I wrong? Where do I need instruction? Where am I off? How do I get back on? Got it? Has nothing to do with, oh, God, fix this and fix that. No, you, God only gives three things. Knowledge, wisdom, and what? Read it in Proverbs. Jesus Christ teaches it. All right. So we have this racial profiling. Just because they blew up our Twin Towers, you know, and <laughs> attacked several hundred people, massacred them, shouldn't, we shouldn't have racial pro profiling. Well, maybe. <laughs> it all depends. You know, there's a phrase that goes, once bitten, twice shy, right? Once bitten, twice shy. I'm in that case. I'm twice as cautious with dogs. If someone is said to be once bitten, twice shy, it means that someone who has been hurt or has been something go wrong will be far more careful the next time. What were we talking about? It wasn't the same. It doesn't matter. It seems similar, therefore it is the same under associate what? Is it making sense? Now, why is this important? Because associating something is deadly. Is really deadly. Remember, I told you that nobody, when you know that God is, well, how are you going to know God is? You act on his word and as God directs and you see that God is what? There. And then you continue to do so, which is kadis, which is talking about growing. That's why the word grace is kadis. It means growth and development. Like if you go to college to be a doctor, you spend 12 years in there. You need kadis, constantly focused and growing and developing until you get your dawn, you develop, you're out. Is that making sense? It's not like, just have faith, believe in. You know, faith belongs with Neptune and Poseidon. Same, same God. One's Greek, one's Roman. You know, Jupiter, <laughs> you know. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Pistis is the, is the path you take. All right. So with that in mind, does anyone know who this is? <laughs> yeah. We know who this is. We, are. we know the symbol, right? It, well, formerly it was Jupiter. Of course, they changed it, and now we're at Santa Claus. How about the Easter Bunny? What does eggs and a bunny have to do with each other? Bunnies don't lay eggs. Bunnies don't hatch from eggs. What is this all about? They're fertility symbols, religious fertility, ancient religious symbols. The egg is fertility, and the rabbit is really fertile animal, right? Really fertile, right? So this deals with fertility. But we don't have that anymore. We don't talk about that. We don't go to the Vestal Virgin Temple to have, you know, whatever. We don't go there anymore. But anyway, and this is a joke. This is still, we still do it. And I'm not, anyone has the right to worship whatever God they want. But this is still Greek and Roman. Got it? It's an import when Julius Caesar imported the Germans into the Roman Empire. But anyway, so this and this when you hear about Santa Claus, who else do you hear about? Jesus Christ. This is bullshit. And when you hear about the Easter Bunny, you also hear about who? So should it buy us. This is bullshit. This is bullshit. Jesus must be 
Got the problem? Associative bias. There's no way. That, do you believe in, yeah, I believe in Santa Claus. That's religion. It doesn't exist. It's not real. But you got to keep it going. Easter Bunny, you believe in Easter Bunny? She's a problem. If you accept these two, you have sealed your doom. You will experience psychogenetic death. You will not survive more than 15 minutes in whatever you're endangered with. Because you associated God with Santa Claus or with the Easter Bunny. Do you see the problem? Well, Frank, don't you celebrate Christmas? Uh, no, I don't. I'm not, it's Saturn. I mean, you want to read about it in Jeremiah? Jeremiah tells you, don't do it. Don't bring your stupid tree into your house. Don't do it. Don't decorate it with gold and silver and put a star on it. Don't do it. But guess what? Everybody still, I know it says no in the Bible, but I like to do it. Okay, <laughs> whatever. But understand the consequences. Then God is not real to you. And you're going to get a chance to experience psychogenetic deaths. Your life will be very short. And you'll be unable to handle a challenge. You will give up. You need to know that God is. And the only way to do it is by acting on his word. And seeing the results. Otherwise, you'll have a very miserable and short life. Got it? That's why this is so frickin' deadly. Why is Santa Claus deadly? Why is Easter Bunny deadly? Because it seals off God from a person with their heart and soul and mind to attempt the word to see that it's real. See the problem? Now, how important is the word? Is there a book on Santa Claus? No. Is there a book on Easter Bunny? No. Is there a book on Zeus or Jupiter or, or Saturn? Or No, there's no book. That's what, whatever you want him to be, he'll be. God has a book and he holds to it. The question is, do we? Do we even know what it says? Isn't ignorance an excuse? And the answer is, I want this to be crystal clear how this works. Because unless you know that there's a God, that's why you got to know that God what? Is. If you don't know that God is, then there's a problem because you're going to be succumb to psychogenetic death. Slightest little challenge, longest time you have is 15 minutes. That's why knowing that there's a God and allowing him to work and, him, and bringing it into pass in your life, then you continue to see it greater and greater as you do. Does that make sense? You never get, and most people, when adversity comes up, they run like hell and they never grow. And that's the shame. They never experience God. They all got it all, they can say the verses and they can repeat all kinds of nice things, but they don't have it in their heart and soul and mind. I don't want you to be in that state. It's death. Got it? Take your challenges, face them, and let God work it out for you. Don't quit, don't give up, and allow God to come through. Got it? God promised it, it's going to happen. Not when you want to, when God knows it's best for you. All right. Now we have another problem. Because we know we need to learn about God, and everybody wants to go to God, but you run over it, and God does not live. God who... God who fills all heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with what? Hands. Well, you got to go to church somewhere, don't you? No. 
The building is not it. You've got to build up that which is God's word in you. You add to it. You strengthen it. You build it. You continue to apply it. You grow. You develop. You learn where you made the mistakes and you correct it. It's you and God. Nothing comes between you and God. No church, no individual comes between you and God. I don't come between you and God. Neither does anyone else. My job is to get you to God and you grow with God. There's no one in between. Jesus don't even stand in between. He got you there. Now he's like, okay, go. The works that I do shall you do what? Also, and greater works than these because they go unto my Father. It's you and God. Jesus did it for you. Now you and God walk together. Unless you don't want to. Does that make sense? So the biggest problem we have is translations. Yes or no? Because if we need to go to the Word to find out what we need to know, and we have problems with translations, the question is, which translation do we use? And were the translators really that good? People say, what problem could there possibly be? Just take it word for word. Really? All right, let's just try that. Let's go into Song of Solomon, chapter 7, 1 through 7. We're going to take it word for word, right? Now, you lay, how many here, all the ladies, raise your hand, please? Okay. Now, I want you to picture some gorgeous, good-looking guy, some Adonis, comes up, and he says these words to you. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes. Please don't take them off, right? <laughs> oh, prince's daughter, the joints of thy thighs are like jewels. Seriously, try and draw her. You all women would all be offended if someone said this to you. Even if he wasn't Adonis, even if he was, you know, Brad Pitt or something like that. I don't know if that, you know who Brad Pitt is, you know? I don't know. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of a cunning workman. Thy navel is like a round goblet. <laughs> wow! Doesn't that just make you melt? Which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set with lilies. Oh boy, yeah. You try and draw a picture of her. It's like, my God. This guy's got some strange tastes in women, right? Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. <laughs> What? How many women go, oh. <laughs> Thy neck is as a tire of ivory. <laughs> Long neck. Thine eyes like fish pools. <laughs> so, oh my God. And the gates are bent. Thy nose, thy nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. Wow, big <laughs> Pinocchio. <laughs> Thy head upon thee is like Carmel. Mount Carmel, you know, like a mountain. Mm -hmm. That's her head. <laughs> like a mountain. The lady's got some physical deformities. Right? And the hair on her head is like purple. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Say they had purple hair back then too. No, that's what we're talking about. But understand, word by word translation, what do you get? Doesn't make any sense. No woman would put up with this. They'd be running the opposite way. The king is held in the galleries. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love, for delights. This is thy stature, is like a palm tree, skinny, straight. Okay, she's got a big belly. She's really thin. She's got a long neck and a big nose. <laughs> oh, she is fugly. I mean, it's, she's bad. <laughs> this is thy statue like a pun. And thy breasts, two clusters of grapes. Oh, my God. Oh, that would be a nightmare, wouldn't it, to have a woman like that? The thing is, this is a word-by-word -word translation, which I think is quite humorous. 
because it doesn't explain anything and leaves you thinking, this is totally ridiculous. Right? Making sense? What woman would put up with this after five minutes of this? How many would make it down to this line? How many would make it all the way to the bottom? Not one of you, would you? Get me away from you. <laughs> all right? So, thy two breasts are like two young wolves. And then, on down here, thy breasts are clusters of grapes. Lumpy little things, aren't they? All right, so we got a real problem as to what this is all about. Right? I mean, how many women would really find that a great honor to be told this? Not us, not no one in this room, I don't think. What's going on? All right, you're in the cars, right? Right? So how would you, if you were talking about an extraordinary woman, describe her in terms of an automobile? <laughs> don't mention her exhaust. I'm just talking about... <laughs> <laughs> but you understand you, it, the terminology. How many have got something that they really love a lot? Love a lot, right? All right. What do you what do you, what do you love a lot? What do I love a lot? Yeah. Huh? Photography. Photography. Okay. Describe him in terms of a camera. <laughs> you can, I mean, I had one guy describe a woman, because I did this kind of like this before, and I said, describe a woman in terms of a car. He goes, oh, man, she's, 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 a, she's got Webley headers on her. She's got freaking dual exhaust. She's like, her, she, she's a V8, man. She's a V8. You know? And he's talking about all the accoutrements. She's got bow speakers and all that. She, he's really going off on this, right? And he said, well, what about women you don't care about much? Oh, those, those are, those are, you know. Kias and stuff like that, <laughs> VWs. <laughs> so he was ranking the women in terms of automobiles and what they had, right? So this gentleman, this is given, and you've got to understand what he's talking about. Is this a poem of love? Is he expressing his love? Yes, but from the perspective of who? God's word. This is what's not understood. All the usages, all the words are in the context of the scriptures. He's seeing her from God's perspective. That's why it says that a, a virtuous woman whose price is far above what? Rubies. All these terms that you're here are all biblical terms. Let me explain to you. First of all, feet with shoes, right? Does it really mean feet? I've taught you feet means what? Thoughts. What are shoes on your feet? All right, let's go there. We'll go and we'll move it down here. Feet with shoes, what do they mean? Well, Ephesians 6.15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, how beautiful are your thoughts when they're confined within the boundaries of the word? Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. But if you don't have the accuracy of the word, then what you don't have your feet shod. They're not with shoes. Got it? Got it? If you haven't got your feet shod, that means, now in the Bible times, shodding wasn't like ours with a top. It was more like sandals, and it, and it just folded over your feet. So the sides of your feet were protected, but not the, the top was pretty much open. So your feet was totally wrapped. All your thoughts are wrapped. How beautiful, how, and how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of peace and bring good tidings of good. What's good? The word of God fulfilled. Right. So... Someone who teaches God's word needs to have the preparation of the gospel, the knowledge of God's word in order to speak. And if they don't, in other words, shut up. Got it? So the woman who 
has the knowledge of God's word and accurate and speaks it. That's what this is about. That her heart, her soul, her mind is within the confines of the word. Pretty cool, huh? Preparation of gospel, that is having your feet shod. Thy navel is like a round goblet. Well, if you have a round goblet, that's a pretty big tummy, right? Is that what we're talking about? No, 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 no. You see, when you, how many of you remember when you were in, in your mommy, in, uh, in vitro, right? Remember when you were in the womb? Anyone remember that? No? No remember? Well, how did you get, how did, how did your mommy feed you while you were inside the womb? Through the what? Yeah, she would push it into her belly button and feed you, right? No. <laughs> you all were fed through your what? Your navel, your belly, your belly button, your, your navel, right? Your umbilical cord. That's how you received nourishment. It was, it was not something you did or anyone did for you. It was part, it became a part and was in you, right? The navel is like a round goblet. The goblet is what a king drinks out of not a commoner. It's a highest value and quantity. So the life, remember Jesus says, out of thy belly will flow rivers of living water. Out of thy belly. That's what this is referring to. That from her comes life and her speech and what she does. So from her out comes the rivers of water, thoughts and images of God. To strengthen, to bless, to build. That's an extraordinary woman. So all these things are like, well, like wisdom. Wisdom, everything is here is what wisdom does. That's why a woman is personified in wisdom. Every time wisdom is used, it's a her. Every time it's knowledge, it's a he. Right? That's why the confusion between Jesus Christ and the Word of God. That's beside the point. All right. Proverbs 3, 5, and 8. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thy own what? Remember I told you, the suche? Getting it heart and soul and mind in line, and that's the reality, focusing on it. All thy ways, all, how much is all? All thy ways, acknowledge him. Acknowledge his existence, acknowledge his oversight, acknowledge his wisdom, his truth. And he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy what? Navel. Bang! Here we go again. Back to the navel. That's where your essence of life comes out. That's what your heart, soul, and mind, that's what Jesus talks about, out of your belly, from your belly, shall flow rivers of living water. That's what this is all about. But how many here did your own private interpretation? I kind of led you that way, didn't I? <laughs> but you see, these are all symbols. The hearing they may hear Seeing they may see, and that's exactly what you just did. And you missed it. I could spend all day on these. These are like really intense, but I won't. But I will go into something else. Romans 13, 1, right? This is the big problem. How many remember, or how many heard of, I don't think you remember, or heard of the concentration camps during the Nazi regime? Ever heard of them? Right? That was pretty intense. Um, who was in those concentration camps? One third was Jews. One third was political prisoners, mostly communists. And the other third were Christians from the churches who opposed Hitler. Whole churches were put in there. Bang. Just like what happened in China last year. There were 300 churches. Now there's none. They're gone. Where they went? They're all imprisoned. Gone. Gone. That would never happen here. Might. Got to be able to walk with God. Be ahead of the curve. Got it? How about Stalin? Stalin hated the Bible. First thing he did was send to the gulag Christians. Why? 
because the only ones that had courage and strength to oppose him were Christians. But when he sent them away, when Hitler ordered them to go with it, they go, okay, and they just went and died. Is that God's will? When Stalin ordered all Christians to be sent to the gulags, they just volunteered and went, okay, and went. Is that God's will? Romans 13.1. This is the problem. This is what's taught. And this is what we got to learn. What is it talking about? They use Romans 13 to justify every single, that means the, hot, the Nazi regime, Stalin's, Lenin's governments under the communist regime, Pol Pot, every single one. If they tell you to do something, you must do it, even if it means your death, because that's what it says in Romans 13. Does it really say that? We'll find out. Let every soul, that mean every without exception or distinction? Distinction. Those who submitting to the word of what? God. God doesn't care about people who don't know him. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now that's the question. What's the higher powers? It's someone who's not average, but more knowledgeable in that which is of God. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So, so we have God, then we have these powers, and then you got you and me. So what is the ordained of God? Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some what? Apostles, some what? Prophets, some what? Evangelists, some what? Pastors, and some what? Teachers, there we go. Basically, you start off, this is where you start to teach, then you take care of others, then you start helping out, bringing people who have no knowledge of God whatsoever and bringing them in. And then you rise up to being a prophet and then an apostle. An apostle can do all of these. This is the hierarchy. Some of you may be teachers. Some of you may become pastors. Some of you may become evangelists. Some of you may become prophets. Some of you may become apostles. Not my call. That's between you and God. But that's the higher powers. These are ordained by God, not man. Doesn't make a difference what man calls them. I don't care how many funny, stupid hats they wear. It has nothing to do with it. It's how much word do you know, how much do you apply, and how much are you helping others to apply it. That's the higher powers, and there is no other power because they're not putting themselves between you and God. They're exalting you to go directly to who? To God. So this higher powers is those ordained of God. The center point and surface and focus is God, not the religion, not the organization. Got it? Romans 13, 2. This is the second verse. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the power, the authority. What authority? That are ordained by God. Of who? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and what? Teachers. All right? Can you all say it with me? Apostles prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Okay. So whosoever therefore resists the power of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, right, resists the ordinance, those ordained of God. Who are the ones ordained of God? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And they that receive shall receive themselves damnation. No, it's the word judgment. I don't, that's not damnation. I'm going to turn you into a frog. No. Yeah. No. It just means judgment. You get a judgment. Dude, you're off, man. <laughs> Isn't that why we go to God to get judgment anyway? You're off here. You need more here. You got that right. So that's what they're there for. That's what I'm here for. I'm going to help you get to who? God. And when you need help, I'm here to help you. And whatever you're lacking, I'm here to help you get. Right? No one comes between you and God. And I mean nobody. Cool? So that doesn't mean damnation. It means what? Judgment. You don't, you don't condemn anybody. You give them the right information to make the what? The judgment. How many of you ever had me condemn you? It ain't happening. 
I'll inform you. I may endeavor to persuade you, but it's not my call. That's between you and who? God. I can just tell you what the word says. Now, the third verse. This is so important. All the politicians use this like crazy. You've got to know where it really says. Got it? Romans 13.3. For rulers. What rulers? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the word ruler means overseer. That's all it means. Overseer. Are not a terror to good works, but to evil. No kidding. Ungodly. Will thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good. What's good? Bringing God's word to pass, right? And thou shall have praise of the same. How many here have me be your, I'm your, your, what do you call that? Your cheering section? Your cheering leader? I'm your cheerleader. Go, go, get him, get him, go, go, get him, get him. Go, go, go. Right? I'm here to teach you, to make you realize how valuable and important you are to God. To keep you pumped up with the word. Keep you walking in power. No yawning. Okay. <laughs> Romans 13.4. For he, he who? Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and what? Teacher. Is the minister of who? Duh! Duh. How hard is that? Pfft, that fits, does it fit with the rest? Yeah, it fits perfectly, right? What for? Minister, for thee for what? Good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. What? What? Sword? Huh? What? Okay, we got a problem with that. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword. Of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> he bears the Word of what? God. He speaks it. He teaches it. He admonishes you to it. He directs you to it. He helps you understand it. That's where his job is. That's what my job is. And eventually yours. Got it? Got it? Got it? Got it? So that's why it's not really difficult. Sword is the Word of God. He beareth not the what? Which is the word. the word of God in vain. For he is the, again, minister of God. Okay, is it getting, can we see the connection here? It's talking about what? How come you're the only one who knows this? All right. A revenger to execute. <laughs> Wrath upon him that doeth evil. This is weird. Where the hell did this come from? Well, it came from the Latin Vulgate. And that's where everybody believed when they did the 1611 translation, so they didn't want to get anyone upset. That's not what it says. Notice this is in what? Italics. It's what? Added by the translator. Not in the text. There's no word there. No corresponding Greek words. Added. All right, so that leaves us with revenger, right? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will replace, says God. You don't. So what do you mean, revenger? This is, this is that, you know, bullshit <coughs> thing. All right. So what's the revenger? Well, it's only used two places in the Bible, just two. Here's one. Guess what the other one is? Thessalonians. Right. So, the word is ekdikos, right? Ek means out. And, and dikos is to, it's like a referee. You know what referee? He ekdikos. Ah! Bring it up, bring it up. Ah, yeah. It's the referee. It's the guy that's on the field. He's not a player. He's outside being a player, but he makes what? Judgment calls. He's an ekdikos. He, he does what's called ekdikos. It's a judgment. How many of you ever played sports without someone to judge? Why have an arguments? You always want to have an argument. Everybody's like, I just want to no, I don't want to. I want to talk about it. I the rule book. Right? You don't have a, you don't have a referee. It's a, it turns into a fight. Right. You got to have someone who's going to judge and referee it. Guess what the referee's called? Adikos, that's right. Got it? So, he's an Adikos. 
He's in the Dikos. He's in the Dikos. Okay. He's in the Dikos. Concerning what? Wrath upon him that do with evil. If you keep going that way, you're going to get in trouble. Sound like something I've been doing lately? Okay. This is what the word says. Well, Frank, you smoke a pipe. I, pff, that's nothing to do with the word. <laughs> and you got a beard. You know, like, what? Well, you understand the problem? I had some person who said, you can't be a God if you got a beard. Like, really? <laughs> that discounts Jesus, too. All right. So, woo! All right. So, a dikos just means to give a what? Judgment. So, you see someone doing something stupid, you're going to sit there and say, hey, uh, you know, you might want to consider what the word says on this. They can still make them do whatever they want to, as long as they understand the what? Consequences. As long as they know the consequences, they can do whatever they want to. They made the judgment. But if they own the action, they have to own the consequences. Does that make sense? Ekdikos. Wrath is that which is consequences. God doesn't, he's not out to destroy anybody. All right, so the only other place that's used, second in the Bible, is in Thessalonians 4, 6. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Because... That the Lord is the avenger. And there's that word. Adikos. Same word. Who is the one? So a referee is speaking from the what? Rule book. And who wrote the rule book? God. So all you're doing is speaking what God once said. That's it. That's why you get apostles, prophets, you know, because you're doing that on a regular basis. Isn't that cool? I'm always thought of, have you ever thought of yourself as an apostle or pastor or teacher? Yes. You ever had those ideas? Yes. I, I think you all, hey, you got it in you. It's in there. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned. There it is. What's he doing? Ekdikos. As we also have what? Forewarned you. Who's speaking? The apostle Paul. What's he doing? He's doing this. He's calling it out right there and testify, proving it. There it is in the scripture. So he's calling it out. And he's doing the very thing that this is talking about. <gasps> Could the Apostle Paul be an apostle? Yes! <laughs> the apostle Prophet Evangelist Pat, he's doing his job. All right. Isn't that cool? This is not there. All right, so now we move on. Romans 13, 5 through 7. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, that means consequences, but also for conscience sake. This word wrath, you see this over here? This thing, it's called balance, right? When I keep putting stuff over here, the balance is out of whack, right? It's not broke. I'm just saying you start weighing down and there's consequences, there's no consequences when it's balanced, but when you go too much to one side, there's a, there's a problem. And that's what this is talking about. In fact, honor your father and mother. That means give weight. Give weight to your father and mother in the word, as it says in Ephesians. Give weight. We all give weight sometimes. Like when it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, it means his, he was, his heart was weighed. He put more weight on his own heart than what God said. So his own perception became more valuable than what God said. And what did it do for Egypt? What did it do for him? What did it do to his firstborn? Hooray! They all enjoying this. Yes. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, okay, okay, for they are God's ministers, again, ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. All right, so a pay ye tribute. That means, you know, because it says in Proverbs, trust the Lord with all thy heart, and not to thy understanding, and always acknowledge him, and he should direct thy paths. Honor the Lord with thy what? Substance. That's what this is talking about. That's a tithe. Just a tithe. Everybody who's really walking with God knows that you have to, you have to be a part of the household. Not when you're starting out, not when you're a babe. Babes don't need to pay, don't need to support the household. They're babes. How many have a six-year-old you got out there sending out working and coming back with his paycheck? 
You don't do that to babes. Babes don't pay, don't give tithes. They don't pay for that. I mean, do you send your kids out and kick them out? You can't spend the night unless you bring some money in, right? No, you're not going to do that. Is that what your parents do to you? Okay. <laughs> Is that what your wife does to you? <laughs> Is this making sense? So, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due. That means that's that tribute. I contribute, contribute, which is referring to tithe or Bentley sharing. Custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Isn't that cool? That's what it's talking about. It's talking about, ready? Give me the words. All right. Watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Okay, yeah. <laughs> watermelon. <laughs> you ever been in church and you don't know the stupid song? You just go watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. <laughs> Sing along with everybody. No one knows any different. This is so funny. Oh my gosh. All right. So we know what this says, right? What's it talking about? Uh, All right. Now let's go into the good news that came from Billy Bright and Billy Graham. This is their Bible they put together. We're going to read. Chapter 13, verse 1. Notice I don't have it. I have a paperback. I don't want to waste my money on anything else. <laughs> but anyway, Billy, if you watch your Billy Graham, they'll give you one of these. They're great for firewood. All right, so um, we're going to go into Romans 13. This is allowed in China. This is allowed in Russia. This is allowed in North Korea. Okay, This is only this Bible. Translation from this Bible. Wonder why. Okay. Why? So here we go. Where am I going? Romans what? 13. 13, right arm. Everyone must obey the state authorities because no authority exists without God's permission. And the existing authorities have been put there by God. Wow, Hitler was put there by God. Stalin was put there by God. Pol Pot was put there by God. Or do you see a problem? Whosoever there opposes the existing authority opposes what God has ordered. Oh, boy. See why the Chinese authority allows this? And anyone who, anyone who does, so, does so will bring judgment on himself. For rulers are not to be feared by those who, who do good, but by those who do evil. Would you like to be unafraid of the man in authority? Then do what is good, and he will praise you, because he is God's servant working for your own good. But if you do evil, then be afraid of him, because his power to punish is real. He's God's servant. I don't know if you've ever been to Mexico, but I understand that everyone in Mexico, all the authority, the policemen, government is, you know, Put there by God. <laughs> and carries out God's punishment on those who do evil. For this reason, you must obey the authorities, not just because of God's punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. That is why you pay taxes. <laughs> because the authorities are working for God when they fulfill their duties. Pay them what you owe them. Pay your personal and property taxes. <laughs> now that was from Billy Graham and Billy Bright. Two dominant, you know, you ever been to Billy Graham? You know, reach out to Jesus thing, you know, that kind of thing they do. Now I'm going to the Roman Catholic Church now. We're going to bring out the Roman Catholic Bible. We're going to read Romans. 13. Tell me if there's any difference. I've just taught you how to research the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Learn exactly what it says. So I'm going to read to you the Roman Catholic virgin, version of this. Y'all ready? Here we go. I'd leave too. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. You must all obey the governing authorities since all governments comes from God. The civil authorities are appointed by God. And so anyone 
who resists the authority and is rebelling against God's decision. Does anyone see a problem with this? Aren't you glad this is not the Bible you have? This is what they give in North Korea, by the way. This is what they give you in China. Good behavior is not afraid of magistrates. Only criminals have anything to fear. If you want to live without being afraid of authority, you must live honestly, and authority may even honor you. The state is there to serve God for your benefit. If you break the law, however, you may well have fear. The bearing of the sword has its significance. The authorities are there to serve God. They carry out God's revenge by punishing wrongdoers. You must obey, therefore not only because you are afraid of being punished, but also for conscience sake. This is also the reason why you pay taxes, since all government officials are God's officers. They serve God by collecting taxes. Pay every government official what he has a right to ask, whether it be direct tax, indirect, fair or honor. All right. You see the problem? And that, if you go, to, you go to Roman Catholic Church, that's what they're going to give you as a Bible. It's accepted in every country. How is it Hitler, those Christians, marched off with the Jews to the concentration camp? How come all those Christians willingly allowed themselves to be killed by Pol Pot? Why is it that people willingly died under Stalin and Lenin? They were Christians. See the problem? Why don't people know the truth? Because nobody wants to say anything. You might offend the governing authority. Because you got to pay taxes, right? Do you all enjoying this so far? So is this talking about government authorities? No. It's talking about what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and what? Teachers, which some of you may be. Well, I'm not, if you're, if you're a woman. It doesn't have, a, it's neutered, not neither male or female. They have women pastors, they have women pastors, they have women prophets. Some of the most awesome women are in there. All right, so you see the greatness of this. How important are you to God right now? You see why, what does this do? What does, this is great, but what does this do? It makes you what? Makes you give up, makes you psychogenically dead you won't be able to meet a challenge. That's why all Christians were the first to suffer. They had the lie, and they were deceived. But you no longer. Got it? You have gone, people say, well, how is people, how you can how you can be so brave? You don't have to be brave, just know the word. <laughs> it just automatically comes out, right? You're not afraid. That's what's cool about this. The most bravest, the most time you'll be the most brave is when you know God is what? With you. And everybody else will then go, wow. That's, it's not me, it's God. God's there. And the only way to know it is if you act on the word and move forward. That's why people hate to go with me. You know, you ever go with me to a barbershop? Can't keep my mouth shut. They're just cutting my hair. I get, I get, they can't go anywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I teach them the word. If we get trapped with me in an elevator, I got at least five minutes, right? I'm going to speak the word wherever I go. It's very important that people know the what. Because all people have right now are lies. And they're programmed to die. You are not to be programmed to die. You're programmed to what? Live. 200 and what? Greater than what you are now. How is it Abraham could live to be 130 years of age? How is it that Moses could be 120 and had the strength and force of someone 30? How is that possible? I'll give you three guesses. He lived 240 times greater. 
because God was his what? Reality. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that not, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, did they rightly divide it? No, they didn't. Have you rightly divided it? Because Romans 13 is not about the rulers of your country. It's not about the policemen. Oh, by the way, I got one that says the policeman is, your, is ordained of God too. Several other terrible translations. I got them buried behind here. It's different. I don't want anyone to see them. I threw a couple of them in the fireplace. But anyway, that's not the word of God. This is what I'm teaching you is the word of God. Got it? So, what's Romans 13 talking about? Ready? There's five, right? Five. That's why it's real easy. You got five fingers, right? Okay. Go. Yeah. All right. Give yourselves a hand. That was awesome. Woohoo. You're one of the few that know what this thing's talking about. <laughs> Father, thank you for the greatness of your word. Thank you for our lives that we may truly continue to grow, to learn, to be strong and courageous, to be able to be at greater than our maximum that we could ever imagine, because this is our ability, because your word opens the door for our total freedom in heart and soul and mind. I thank you for your protection and blessing upon each person here as they continue to grow and learn and recognize your presence, walking in the greatness of your word, standing in your shadow, and walking in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead are risen, and return, Lord Jesus, your anointed. All right, ready? You are God's what? Yeah. Best.